Hi, everybody. Let's walk through an ideal reheat ranking cycle problem. This is a pretty long one, but just remember with any of these cycles, with every single cycle we run into, let's go ahead and show it. You're usually trying to find the enthalpy at every single point, and you're using the information that's given you to do that. Now, in this problem, it gives us pressures. So it says the highest pressure is 8,000 kilopascals. Then I have a mid pressure of 500 kilopascals. And finally, the condenser is being operated at 10 kilopascals. That gives me these three lines. Then it will give you temperatures. So going into the high pressure turbine, I know it's 8,000 kilopascals and 450 degrees Celsius. And that is superheated, which means that's enough. Going into the low pressure turbine, it's 500 kilopascals and 500 degrees Celsius. And it's superheated, so that's enough to solve for those both of those points. I can solve for point one because I know it's a saturated liquid right here. And I also can figure out what point two is because I know the change in pressure. So really the only points that are going to take a little bit of work are point four and point six. So with any of these problems, please make sure you're drawing the uh, diagrams at the very beginning and then just walk your way through it. If you get stuck on one point, jump, jump to another point and see if you can work your way backwards. Sometimes you have to. So, like I said before, we have 8,000 kilopascals at the top and 450 degrees Celsius going into that um, high pressure turbine, and then 500 kilopascals and 500 degrees Celsius going into the low pressure turbine. I've got condenser operating at 10 kilopascals, and let's see, I want to determine the mass flow rate through the boiler needed for the system to reduce a net 5,000 kilowatts of power, as well as figuring out the thermal efficiency of the cycle. Use the steam tables. And if you click on, that's the, either the pressure and temperature table for saturated mixture or the superheated vapor table. We don't really use the compressed liquid table because the enthalpy of a compressed liquid is more or less the same as the enthalpy of a saturated liquid at the same temperature. Okay, let's get right to this. So we already drew the process. So now let's get the properties from Appendix A5. Now what properties? Well, this is not going to jump ahead myself. We're going to start at point 1. And so we have 10 kilopascals, so we know the pressure. So go to your saturated mixture pressure table and find the enthalpy of a saturated liquid, which comes out to be 191.81. We're also going to need the specific volume so we can um, calculate how much work the pump does and get the enthalpy at point 2. So let's get that work of a pump. This is something you're going to see all the time. It's simply my specific volume times my change in pressure. So that's the specific volume we got from the previous step times that change in pressure from 10 all the way up to 8,000 kilopascals. So a big jump there. With that, I have my work of my pump. This should all be seeming familiar from our last problem we did, and it's all very similar. Honestly, these problems are fairly well connected. Now, if I know the work of the pump, I know how much my enthalpy has changed from 1 to 2 because I'm just adding the work of the pump to it. As you can see, once again, it's fairly small, just about 4% of the total enthalpy so far. Um, so sometimes this is even completely neglected. I'm not going to in this case. So we get about 200 kilojoules per kilogram at this point, and we're doing well. Okay, keeping my diagram there, let's keep on moving on to point 3. Now, because point 3 and point 5 are both in superheated properties, um, superheated table, probably best for me to go ahead and get all of their information at the same time. So I find the right pressure, I go down and find the temperature, I go across and I get my enthalpy and my entropy. If you're wondering why I got entropy, it's because I know that this is um, an isentropic turbine, which means that the entropy at 3 is the same as the entropy at 4. I'm going to use that to find my quality, both at the 500 kilopascal case as well as at the 10 kilopascal case, and then from that get my enthalpy. So that's why you're getting the entropy is because you have an isentropic turbine. It's very common to do that. I went ahead and got it for both of those states because it just makes it faster to do it while I'm in the same table. And now we got to get a whole bunch of stuff from Appendix A5 for the pressures we're dealing with. First 500 kilopascals and then for 10 kilopascals. So for 500 kilopascals, using an entropy that it's going to be the same at 3 and at state 4, I can look up this information. 
So this came from my table. This came from my table. And then from that I can calculate the quality. Now if you know the quality, you can find out any other property of that mixture using the quality. And so that's what I do right here. I find out the enthalpy at 0.4 is equal to the enthalpy of a saturated liquid at 500 kilopascals plus the quality times the enthalpy of vaporization at 500 kilopascals. So that's 640.1 kilojoules per kilogram, plus all that gives me 2,636.4 kilojoules per kilogram. And you know what I'm gonna do? I wanna go ahead and show that to you. I wanna show you that in the table. So I'm gonna jump over there using some movie magic. Now here I am in the tables, and I wanna to go to the saturated water pressure table because I've been given a lot of pressures. I'm gonna find 500 kilopascals, which is a little ways down. And I'm gonna go ahead and capture my screen so you can see all the values that I got from this. So here is 500 kilopascals going all the way across. This right here is SF, that's SFG. This right here, let me make sure I do it right, is HF, this is HFG. If you're wondering how I know that, you can go to the very top of the table and you'll see it said what each of these are. So don't worry about memorizing it. It's good to go and check. I'm just doing that really quickly. So this right here is how I found the quality. And I'm using that quality to then find my enthalpy. And that's a pretty common thing. So I just wanted to show you where that came from. So now, using some more movie magic, let's jump back to the problem. Okay, so we had just calculated our enthalpy at state four. And so we only have one state left, which is 0.6 right there, state six, which is also a saturated mixture. And we're gonna do the exact same process to get that state. So we're gonna use the fact that we know what the pressure is. It's now 10 kilopascals. And we know the, enthalpy, uh, sorry, the entropy at state six is the same as entropy at state five. So since they have the same entropy, I can use that entropy to calculate my quality. Now remember, this is a different quality. These are not the same because this is just two different states. If you got the same number, it can happen. It was just, it's just coincidence. There's no like magical connection between the two. So this is what I know from my superheated vapor tables. I found the entropy there. This is what I found from my saturated mixture table, just looking it up. And using those two, I can then find the quality. And if I know the quality, I can find out any other property of that saturated mixture. So I get my enthalpy for state six. Now we have the enthalpy of every single state. And so using that, we can find our, work, our net work output per kilogram, um, as well as figuring out our net heat input. And from that, we can figure out what our mass flow will need to be, as well as what our thermal efficiency is. So let's determine the heat input and rejection. Now, just so you know, there's two places where heat is added and one where it's rejected. So let's redraw this diagram real quick so you can see that. Something like that. So heat goes out of the system right there at the bottom. That's in the condenser from state six all the way to state one. Heat goes into the fluid when I go from state two to state three, as well as when I reheat it between state four and state five. So that's what you're seeing right here. I have heat input between four and five and heat input between two and three. Oh, and of course I'm running over this. I have heat out in the condenser between states six and one, just like I showed you on the diagram. Now let's determine the mass flow rate. To determine the mass flow rate, we first have to figure out what our net work is for our system. And our net work is equal to our heat input minus our heat output. Now that's just from conservation of energy. If you wanted to check this, you can, and you'll still see it. Here, I'll show it to you, because there's some people who are probably gonna be confused by this. They're like, why did I do those two points? I'll show it to you one more time. So here is our phase change line, and we have this, something like that. This right here is 0.3, that's 
that's 0.5, that's point. I'm failing at my numbering here. I apologize. That is 0.3, that's 0.4. That's 0.5, that's 0.6. So some people might be saying, well, why didn't I just do like find the work output here as well as the work output right there? Why didn't I just do that? Well, that would have been H3 minus H4 plus H5 minus H6, right? That's what it would have been. And you're right, that would give me the net work output. That should work out just fine. At least it would if I didn't also remember, forget that we have the work of the pump too. So that's between one and two. So those are both work out. And work in would be equal to, let's see, H2 minus H1. There we go. Okay. Now, what you probably are realizing is that this is getting pretty complicated. It is. Um, but let's go ahead and write it all the way out and see what it looks like if I write it nicely. So what I then get is I have H3 minus H4 plus H5 minus H6 minus H2 plus H1. Just the sign changed because I subtracted it. Okay, so I have all of those. That seems fine. Well, let's see what Q and minus Q out comes out to be. So I'm going to erase this and write out Q in minus Q out just in terms of the enthalpy. We'll see if it comes out to be the same thing. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's something wrong. So Q in is H3 minus H2 plus H5 minus H4. And I subtracted from that H6, so minus H6 minus a negative, so plus H1. Wait a minute, it's the exact same. So this is coming from conservation of energy. Energy has to go somewhere. So any difference in my heat, input versus output, is due to the work. It's all due to work. Because we are assuming that this is a well, constant flow system, at least the mass is the same. Actually, it's a, a closed system, it's just the same fluid the entire time. So the mass never leaves, and so the only way energy can move is either through heat input and output or work. Okay, so you could have done it either way. You would have gotten the same numbers either way. But I wanted to show you that in case you were wondering why I suddenly switched and got the work in terms of the heat instead of the other way around. So with that, I have my work output. Now, it tells me that I want to have a net power output of 5,000 kilowatts. And so I'm going to use this, as well as knowing how much power output I need, to figure out my mass flow rate. So power output is equal to my mass flow rate times my network in terms of kilojoule per kilogram. So from that I can solve and say I think need 3.229 kilograms per second to really make this work. And finally, let's determine the thermal efficiency. That's just one minus my Q out over Q in. I know that, and it comes out to be 39.49%. I could have also done the other equation, which I show you a lot. I usually like it better, which is my net work over my heat input. And you'll get the exact same number. It's the same number either way. So choose whichever one works best for you. We're done with this problem. So thank you all for listening, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.